My name is Edmund Fong. It's my great uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Professor Prasenjit Diora, who is uh, familiar to uh, most of us in the China field. Um, originally from Assam, India, uh, Professor Diora, better known in China as Du Zhanqi Lao Shi or Du Zhanqi Jiao Shou, um, is a distinguished uh, historian of modern China uh, with a PhD from uh, Harvard University. Uh, he's currently uh, the Raffles um, uh, Professor of Humanities at the National University of Singapore, where he is also a director of the Asian Research Institute. Prior to his uh, appointment uh, to uh, NUS, uh, he uh, um, spent uh, a major part of his career at the University of Chicago, where he was uh, chairman of the Department of History from 2004 to 2007. Um, in the addition to Chinese history, uh, he works um, broadly on Asia in the 20th century uh, and on historical thought and historiography. Uh, he has uh, had brought uh, research interests over the past two decades. In more recent years, um, his uh, interest includes um, modernity, a new imperialism, the global and the regional constitutions of nations from the East Asian perspectives, state, sovereignty, nation, the people, national identity, religion, and uh, citizenship. His admirable scholarship and impressive list of publications are the envy of all uh, Asianists. Um, to read uh, out the list would take up a bit of time, and I'm not going to do that. However, I do want to uh, mention um, some of his major works. And uh, uh, these include uh, his latest book, uh, published in 2009, The Global and Regional in China's uh, um, Nation Formation. In 2003, Sovereignty and Authenticity, Manchu Guo and the East Asian model, a Modern. And in the same year, Decolonization Perspectives from Now and Then. In 1995, Rescuing History from the Nation, Questioning Narratives of Modern China. And uh, his first book, uh, published in 1988, Culture, Power and State, Rural Society in North China, 1900 to 1942, based on his uh, Harvard University uh, doctoral dissertation. All his major books are path-breaking um, and have influenced a generation of China scholars, including, of course, myself. Um, he's an inspiration and I think a model, a role model, for many of us in terms of the quantity and quality of his works. So today we are privileged to have him as our keynote um, speaker. He's um, eminently qualified to speak on a topic, uh, sustainability and transcendency in the Asian century. So it's, it's over to you, uh, Prasenjit. Well, thank you very much, Edmund, for that uh, very elevating uh, introduction. From there, I guess one can only fall. So, uh, unless one completely transcends. But, uh, but you'll see that the topic uh, which I gave, I guess, uh, slightly in short, or maybe it's a short memory, was is a, a, the crisis of transcendence and not simply transcendence. So, there is a problem achieving transcendence. Um, and uh, so I also want to thank uh, my hosts, uh, other than Edmund. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Judith Snodgrass, uh, there she is, and um, uh, Tim Winter, and of course the indefatigable Sylvia, uh, who I think several of us were discussing ways of trying to steal her as administrators of our uh, <laughs> institutes. <laughs> So, um, without further ado, because uh, this is, I will not be reading my paper. I do have, I should mention that this is the, uh, uh, what is presently imagined as the last chapter of a new book, uh, which I'm hoping to complete in a year. 
The book uh, in itself is called uh, Transcendence in a Secular World, um, uh, something like the non-Abrahamic traditions in the Asian century or something like that. We, we'll decide on the proper title. Uh, closer to the time, uh, it's probably not a good omen to have a good title before the, <laughs> before the book is written. So um, let's proceed. Uh, okay. Okay, so what uh, I want to do is really look at uh, universalisms, cosmopolitanisms, uh, positions based on uh, a certain type of transcendence, which I will try to define uh, pretty soon. So the rise of Asia and China, of course, in particular, uh, is accompanied by uh, the need to have to project a more sort of just vision, uh, uh, different from the uh, the imperialist and nationalist vision. At least some some. Uh, groups in China have that view, uh, and um, uh, that is uh, also not just simply a hegemony. Now, historically, we've had uh, actually uh, many universalisms in the in the world, even in the modern period. Uh, you don't just have to have uh, the religions, uh, the Abrahamic and the non-Abrahamic religions. Though I think uh, one one of the things I will try to show is that. Modern universalisms like liberalism, humanism, humanitarianism, Marxism uh, are, uh, seem to be uh, sort of have certain weaknesses, uh, but they do, they do embed uh, what uh, I think of as transcendent ideals and uh, ideals to try to strive for, right, as is the nation, nature of ideals. But we also see that, especially since the end of the Cold War, uh, these uh, modern universalisms are in retreat, uh, yielding to nationalism and consumerism, and so that they are very much in the here and now. And yet, if you think of it, uh, salvation in the world is very urgent, and not, uh, and not metaphorically or not in an afterlife. In fact, planetary sustainability, I would argue, is in fact the transcendent goal of our time. It is a goal that is beyond reach at the moment, but something that we can aspire to. It is certainly beyond us at the moment. So what I want to do is um, uh, make an effort to think through uh, conceptually and the political framework of uh, universalisms, how they've been constructed, what they have done, and how they may work in something that I call the post-Western modernity. Post-Western modernity, which would be chapter two in, a book, in the book I'm doing, is uh, another sort of less laborious way of saying it would be global modernity, but I think it's still very important to, to, to point to that transition, that it is something that is going beyond uh, what we see or saw as uh, Western modernity. Um, okay. So why universalism? Uh, well, there is first a historical reason, I think. From the 19th century, I have argued in, one of, in more than one of the books that Edmund pointed to, I have argued that nation states uh, actually were actually uh, the first expression of globalization. Nation states were themselves global products that were misrecognized as non-global, or at least their, uh, their global dimensions were hidden often from themselves and from their people. Um, you know, all you have to look at is uh, uh, circulatory standards like the Hertz, like national anthems and so on, which sound much more like each other's national anthems than they do like any other music that existed before. And, uh, and even, you know, not just technical and institutional rules, but even, for instance, the concept of the person. So, for instance, the child, if you look at it, this is an example, I'm sorry if so many of you heard it before, but I think it's a very compelling example. In most societies in the world, and in agriculture, certainly I remember growing up in India, um, that a child, in some ways, in a rural society, ceased to be a child 
after they started join they joined the workforce, which was the age of six or seven in agricultural societies. Uh, and yet, uh, if you look at modern national constitutions, uh, you see that all of them declare the child to be a child till they finish education, the age 18, and it in entails a whole set of rights and obligations on the part of parents and other institutions to deal with them. So, I mean, this makes nations look much more like each other than, they, than their uh, assumed uh, distinctiveness. And even the notion of history, I've argued, and I'll be talking more about that, uh, come to repeat each other. The structures are basically the same. You know, modern, medieval, uh, uh, ancient, and then you need a bit of a renaissance to jump from one to the other and all of that, and you need some propulsive uh, force. Uh, but today, what is happening, so why were, in fact, uh, nations, why did they misrecognize their history? To cut a long story short, they did it because of the system of nation states, which actually was not really a system, it was just a system of imitation and competition, but which, uh, which is an anarchic system. There is no, unlike uh, a pre-modern system with uh, an idea of an absolute god or a universal uh, uh, norm, moral norm and so on, there was no more anymore. And there was just anarchic, whoever sort of, you know, uh, uh, has the power dominates. And so this, the, it emerges as a system because then you have the notion of sovereignty, that you have a piece of territory on which you construct a history of a people, this, that, and the other. And this territory is sovereign. And the, but where does sovereignty come from? Sovereignty comes from assuming a unique history of a people. Uh, and of course, I'm not denying that uh, you, you don't have some unique histories, but you have to do a lot of stuff to make it sort of work the way it's supposed to work in order for you to claim, for their representative to claim sovereignty, right? And sovereignty then begins a way of uh, demarcating your space and defending your people versus some aggressive predator and so So it's really the absence of, uh, the, the anarchy of it that, but at the same time that it does that, and it does that because it's a competitive system, right? I mean, these states are in competition with each other. Uh, at the same time that it does that, it denies its globality, which, uh, for which it depends on for many reasons, including uh, the acquisition of resources. Uh, no nation, particularly today, is rich or poor by itself. It is rich and, or poor because of its relations with the world, with the world, and uh, with the resources from other nations, with markets, with flows, with positioning oneself, and so today the original mismatch of globality and nation states is, I think, worse because of the privatization and transnationalization of capital and the nation state. Now none of your problems can be contained either, right? And so that makes it much more urgent to have a better match. I'm not, I used to, when I wrote Rescuing of the His a Nation State, uh, Rescuing History from the Nation State, I can't remember my own titles, uh, is uh, be uh, very decidedly against uh, the whole idea of the nation. Now I think that uh, we clearly can't do without it, but we can also do with more than the nation. Uh, and so that's what we'll be talking about. So the sources of national wealth and problems, especially environmental, etc is global, and yet the system of remediation is national. There are few authorizing structures that actually validate the uh, transnational governance in society. Uh, at the same time, we live, of course, in what uh, biologists and scholars today are calling the Anthropocene, in which humans, more than any other force, collectively, globally, determine the sustainability of the Earth more than any other force, right? So whether we talk of terrorism, biological, chemical, economic uh, epidemics, or environmental, we've reached a stage where we have to transcend the nation and national interests, even in order to continue to have the nation, right? Whether through collective national arrangements or post-national formations, existing rules of the sovereignty game must change. Okay, let's move on. 
So as an example, I want to talk about uh, what the ADB calls the regional public goods. Probably a better word is regional commons in some way because uh, water is, uh, uh, is uh, I think, is more uh, primordially seen as a commons rather than a public good in which you assume states and so on. Um, the, between the globalization and the nation is a level that is becoming in our time more and more important as a means of mediating, and that's the region, mediating the, uh, the, the nation and uh, global, globalization. So you need to coordinate common and linked problems of regional public goods. Uh, and these include things like climate change, public health, environment, and most of all, I would say water. Uh, the water problem can only be uh, addressed by transnational cooperation across the Himalayan rivers. So the uh, Himalayan plateau is the watershed of about, I've forgotten now, 10 rivers or more, uh, which spread all over, provide water to much of mainland uh, Asia. And so the sharing of these waters is increasingly becoming an issue. Now we have seen uh, that uh, there are, of course, many of these now uh, flow in from uh, the Chinese uh, borders into um, Burma, uh, the Salween into Burma, and the Mekong into three nations. We'll show you uh, waters. And you need, what you need is uh, coordination and transparency to observe the effects across countries. And uh, incidentally, some, some big water problems also exist between India and Pakistan, India and Bangladesh, and these uh, also are uh, turning out to be very difficult to address. Um, and we have, uh, in fact, but one of the most uh, important uh, trigger points is the effort is the occasionally uh, demonstrated effort by the Chinese government to move the waters of the Yarlong Sangbo to, uh, which is the Brahmaputra in uh, India, in Assam, and in Bangladesh, uh, to to fulfill the north south uh, the south north uh, water transfer project, because so much of North China has become arid, uh, but then this will affect the flows of water into South Asia, and you're talking, of course, about uh, very uh, of nuclear armed powers and things like that, and, as are Pakistan and India. So the, this could be lead to dangerous situations. I have some pictures. Here are the flows of the uh, rivers. You can see here, this is the, is my, yeah, this is the Brahmaputta, Yalong Sangpo, this is the Salween, and this is the Mekong. Now you see the dam building, building activities. First you see on the Salween here, and many of you may have heard that uh, 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 one of the dams that was being built in Burma was, uh, uh, was uh, withdrawn. I mean the right to build it was withdrawn. Uh, but there's still a lot of politics between the Karen and the, and the Bur Myanmar government and so on around it. But this will be, and but most of all, of course, is the Mekong. And Mekong, it's now, you can see that there are 13 Chinese dams that are promised there. Uh, two of them, uh, at least four or five of them, this is still an old map, have been built. Uh, the Lao are now being very, the Lao government uh, is now being very uh, uh, difficult about the water because they see they don't have many resources and they think that, uh, producing electricity around this area, but they have been uh, they have received very sharp uh, uh, messages from the Cambodians and the Thais and so on, and so they 've been going back and forth as well but of course, we also know the effects upon the environment of this water is uh, of these uh, damming projects has been very very uh, difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, even if it has not been fully negative, one needs to monitor it. You know, if you look at Cambodia and you look at the Tonle Sap, which swells up to three times its size, if not more, 
uh, at the time and provides livelihood for all kinds of people. You see the quality of fish, you see the quality of the water, you see the quality of the sedimentation. You have to monitor all of these things. And in part, that involves being able to go into other countries, including China and so on, and Pakistan and India, and eat to each other, to be able to assess that your statements are, um, uh, are accurate and that you can do work on it on a, uh, on a, a long-term basis. Uh, but this is not, um, and you know, because right now it is uh, quasi sort of accepted by the Chinese government that the Three Gorges Dam has turned out to be a huge mistake. And dam building everywhere, we see, it was a huge expensive mistake. And uh, the erosion, apparently there's a story that I can't remember who told me, I can't reference it, that one of the things that Po Shi Lai in Chongqing, which is one of the most important parts of the Three Gorges, uh, one, uh, one of the things he did was he threatened the standing committee that I will release the real number of people who are being moved, who are being resettled on a monthly basis from uh, the Gorges area if you don't uh, you know, do things right and uh, do it my way. And that was quite intolerable for them. And so this is, uh, this water politics plays out internally as well and uh, has very uh, powerful effects. Okay, to move uh, to a different uh, register, uh, uh, we, we can understand universalism, but why transcendence? Let me first uh, uh, define transcendence. Transcendence for me is a position of knowledge. It is uh, an epistemic locus, not an ontological idea of God. It is uh, an epistemic locus through which one can take a synoptic view of the world as a whole, right? Where you can distinguish, as Habermas says, from the flood of phenomena, the flood of phenomena from underlying essences, right? The whole notion of science is based on this kind of, uh, in a way, an Archimedean principle that has to be assumed. Uh, so the capacity for abstraction from the here and now and his, the historical condition for uh, universalism uh, is, uh, is also very important. Uh, you know, there's a whole theory, for those of you who are familiar with the axial age theory of Carl Jaspers, and which was then popularized by Shmuel Eisenstadt and others, uh, uh, talked about how uh, six century civilizations, uh, six century BC, BCE as we say now, uh, civilizations uh, were uh, uh, developed partly because of the conditions of large empires and so on. These thinkers, uh, sages, and messiahs who, who were able to produce this vision, uh, this vision of uh, civilization. And this then becomes uh, the basis of Christian, of not Christian, Judaism, Hellenism, uh, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, and so on. Uh, what the locus does is that it works very much. There was an interesting discussion yesterday is, do nation states have ethics? And our speaker said, uh, uh, no, nation states don't have ethics. Individuals have ethics, uh, which I agree with, although you know, one has to translate a bit more from there. So the locus of authority is generated within the self, right? So this idea of transcendent is through a personal experience. But uh, it relates the self to both an ultimate authority in the transcendent uh, and produces a sense of ethical responsibility. It also generates the agency of the self in relation to the world through this new vision, right? If you think of the Buddha and how he sees the world and so on, if you think of Jesus, I mean, these are all, you've had them, although they may have begun in the sixth century, you've had transcendent movements all along. So it's a very powerful source of ethics in the world. And uh, uh, its role has been, I would say, completely underestimated, uh, mainly because of the deep secular trend in uh, historical writing, secular in both senses of the word. And uh, it is, uh, but in fact, 
it has been the locus uh, of uh, a tremendous role for uh, reforming and overthrowing systems, whether it be, you know, uh, Taoist rebellions or the Buddhist reform of the Hindu order or Protestantism, which is, of course, the last, that was the transcendent, that transcendent transcendence, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> it transcended a little too much. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, the, uh, so all of these sort of alternative things are based very much on this sort of locus. I think it's a locus that's very important to identify through history from a historical perspective, not necessarily from a philosophical or a theological perspective, because we do see it playing a very important role. This transcendent locus is often underpinned by sacred authority, which is why, of course, religions are so good at it, right? But it also combines important rational traditions, and I think that's something very important to see. If you look at the non-Abrahamic traditions, they have, I mean, look at something like Confucianism or Taoism, so they don't have a notion of an, a, a personalized God. In fact, in Confucianism, the idea of Tien or heaven is really, uh, you know, doesn't punish you in any direct kind of way, yet uh, the, the Confucian uh, sage or the Confucian scholar, uh, the Junzu, uh, has to somehow intuit that force morally and serve its, its purpose in the world. Uh, so at different times, uh, and you need a whole process of techniques of cultivation, which Foucault in another context would call techniques of the self, right? Uh, and uh, these become very much important, but these are more than techniques of the self. These are techniques, these are a methodology of linking self to different orders, to different scales, uh, from the local to the, uh, to, the, to the universal. And Weber actually knew a lot about these. He called them the intellectual religions of the East. And uh, they had very many uh, rational techniques of cultivation, ethical, yogic, meditative, in approaching transcendent authority, rather than just faith or sacralization, both of which are also very important in this. I don't, don't want to deny it, but I'm trying to sort of see what can be, how these things work. So the locus needs both rational and sacred authority, even in relation to modern ethics, which derives from very much a disenchanted universalism. There's no God in modern philosophical thought other than Christian and Catholic. Certainly the states in most parts of the world are not based on some kind of cosmological authority, except perhaps the cosmology of science and history. Uh, transcendence in the modern era continues to be important, although it is often displaced and sanctions different kinds of values. So how do I define uh, modern universalism? The first, I want to define cosmopolitanism as simply shared sovereignty. That is to say, sovereignty which now resides firmly, or supposed to reside firmly in the nation state, uh, cannot be exclusive. It has to be shared. Shared by what levels is another matter, by what other agencies is another matter, but it has to be shared. Now, and we take a Kantian universalism as the original, the ur form of modern universalism. We just uh, do a little Kantian detour here because I think it's very important to understand him as the basis of all these later modern universalisms. Now, what modern universalisms do since they are, you know, uh, disenchanted, they don't have God, they seek to be non-partial, but also non-transcendent, right? That is to say, fully Archimedean. Right? You have some position outside the world by which you can see it, but that's a non-transcendent position. And Kant probably came out with the most interesting formulation. His categorical imperative was, I must act through maxims by which one can will that they be universal. It's a very cleverly constructed uh, maxim. Uh, and as, you, Udor, as Honora O'Neill uh, has uh, shown us, she's one of the leading interpreters of Kant, she said, this is a negative regulation. It prevents every, anyone from claiming special privilege. So it is both non-partial, right, since it's coming from nowhere, 
as it were, or it comes as a negative injunction to me, uh, but it's also non-transcendent, because nobody is also, is non-partial here. Now, there are, uh, there are competitor contenders of this view. Uh, Palmquist, a philosopher now in Hong Kong, uh, believes, uh, he is a Christian philosopher, uh, believes that uh, Kant recognized divine assistance is necessary for humans to be good, that faith fulfills a genuine need for reason. And so when I read these, I was a little confused. I said, I better read some Kant. <laughs> and so I did uh, uh, read, uh, not very much, but I read a few essays. And one of the essays that I read was Kant's idea for universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view. And here he says it's a very interesting piece because he says history is like the unstable weather, not fully predictable, but which maintains a uniform course of natural events. So long as humans act in faith that this natural course will eventuate, history will end in a civic union of the human race, i.e. cosmopolitanism. So what he's saying is that you know, you know that history will sort of, you know, it may rain today, it may not rain today, or so on, that you can't predict, but you know that there will be a winter after the fall and so on. Ironically, that metaphor is probably being complicated as well, and I don't know how, how one can uh, use that metaphor in an age of global warming. That may be the most decantinizing <laughs> effect of uh, global warming, but, uh, but it is a metaphor, and history doesn't necessarily work at all like the weather. And so, um, so what you get in Kant is that transcendent God is left out of the historical process, but nature or providence, the idea of history, has definitely a goal or a telos, right? Which, the problem is that, however, humans need to believe in this in order to realize this ideal, in order to realize this utopian ideal of history, right? So, uh, so this is very much something that you have to strive for. And if you don't believe in it, it's not going to happen. This is, of course, very much Hegel's spirit. This is very much Marx's utopia. Uh, you, it's there. You know it's there. But unless you really will it, it will not come about, right? So, and this, for instance, if we want to look at it practically, the, involves a huge amount of faith and sacrifice. Look at, for instance, the... Chinese Great Leap Forward. You know, Mao Zedong promised that within 15 years, maybe he was right, we will catch up with uh, uh, steel production in Britain, we will catch up with uh, this and that. And, uh, and, it, uh, and it was the basis of a lot of sacrifice, you know, very religious terms, right? It's this, for this ideal, you, you, you give up all your pots and pans and everything, and uh, it bound, uh, and it's the so faith and uh, sacrifice is the essential ingredient between the boundaries of knowledge and the realization of telos. Um, so this is the promise of rational modernity, but through campaigns building on faith. I think uh, that a lot of those kind of campaigns involve very much, and they involve rituals, rituals of uh, building faith and promising loyalty. So the problem with modern universalism is that it fears the sacrality that such faith requires and cannot invest deep emotion in the symbolism of the goals. So the aporia that we have here is that modern universalism denies sacrality in favor of rationality, but need both because they also need transcendence of some kind. And this transcendence, I will admit, is a weaker sense of transcendence. It is not a godlike figure over the present necessarily, but it is over the present, only it will be realized sometime in the future. So probably it is more. Uh, it's not necessarily that weak at all. It depends on how weak and strong you make it. Now, as we also know, I have nice pictures, I'll have you know, <laughs> uh, uh, all raided from the internet, so please don't. <laughs> um, the uh, nations also in some ways have a transcendence. I mean, nations get you to sacrifice your life for the collective, for the imagined community, right? 
But what kind of transcendence is that? It is a transcendence, it's a self-other kind of transcendence. It is by no means a universal transcendence. It is a transcendence so that you can reproduce a success in the world. So, um, so it too, and as a result of its transcendentity, it has very much religious features, although of course disguised, or what I call trafficked into the secular realm. Uh, so it is a limited form of transcendence that utilizes the sacred symbolism. This is the idea of manifest destiny here, who is providence herself overseeing uh, these people who are going to take over lands from <laughs> other peoples. And, uh, and then the idea of manifest destiny goes over. Then this is very much the sacred authoritative part, the flag, uh, as a power. You have the limited transcendence of nations uh, in India. Uh, this was a picture that actually I saw the original of this in Banaras. It's the temple to Mother India. And, uh, but I couldn't take a very clear picture because it was, uh, the whole map of India is done in this way. And, uh, uh, and this I think is also very interesting because this is uh, Pieta. Right? This is very much the model on the Pieta. And uh, it's with the three bullet wounds, very much like a cross. And uh, so you have that. Then you have the limited transcendence of uh, the Yellow Emperor in China. This is the ceremony for the Yellow Emperor, which has been growing more and more. Somebody told us yesterday that very important retired officials joined the Yen Huang Society. Which, is the, which are the great ancestors, the mythical, or some people say non-mythical. Apparently in China you can't call them mythical, uh, Yellow Emperor and uh, the Yen Emperor. And, uh, but this is getting to be more and more powerful as a, a symbolism of China's ancient past. This is Emperor Yen, Huang and Yen. Uh, this is to bring forth all the overseas Chinese in a common a new ethnic identity. Uh, Mao Zedong's daughter herself is involved, Lina, attending the first Seeking Root festivals. You can see how ritualized it is. Uh, it's actually quite beautiful. Um, OK, so let's move to transcendence in, how am I doing for time? I, I, I'm afraid I have to, I started late. About uh, five minutes? No, uh, 10, 10, OK. <laughs> Um, Tenja and Tien. In recent years, the quest for an Asian vision of the world order, especially in China, uh, has of course been uh, adumbrated and uh, based upon uh, traditional views. Uh, the uh, Chao Ting Yang's model of Tenja, which is all under heaven, uh, which involves the idea of a world government controlling a large territory and military force the states within that, which is all bottled, modeled on the basis of the, uh, the Joe state, of the ideal Joe state, uh, controlling uh, uh, would be, the subordinate states would be independent in most respects except in legitimacy and obligations for which they depend uh, on the recognition of world government. Rather than being based on force and self-interest, the cultural empire would use ritual as a means to limit the self and its interest, and it would be sustained by the transcendent ideal of heaven. Uh, now, there has been a lot of critique of this. Uh, Daniel Callahan and Wang Mingming has recently produced a very interesting essay where he says, yeah, this ideal, to the extent that it operated, operated in the pre-imperial uh, period, the pre-third century BC, uh, where uh, the, the emperor himself was subordinated to under heaven, but post-unification China, the state appropriated Tianxia universalism for uh, instrumental goals and sought to mon monopolize. And this is a very important uh, development. What happens here, as opposed to many other uh, uh, axial civilizations, is that uh, you have uh, uh, the emperor begins over time to exercise a monopoly of access to uh, heaven, to the transcendent locus. 
Um, now, so this is, is, is wrong from the way, uh, well, Weber thought that you know, China didn't really have a transcendence as a result, but uh, I think if you look at history, you have a very different source. There's a lot of competition for transcendence in the Chinese case, and that's how it makes itself uh, felt. You may not see it from a sociological point of view, but when you turn to the historical, that is if you look just at structure and who controls, but if you look at process, you see much more. And the state could not prevent Tian from becoming a transcendent and authoritative source of self-cultivation and ethical life for individuals and groups. Tian and Tao, which is a, a, a Taoist concept but also involved, important in Confucian, remain powerful sources of spiritual and bodily empowerment for Taoist Confucians and what I have studied at great uh, length, the syncretic uh, redemptive societies uh, who were actually very important, uh, much more important than any political organizations and so on in the 20th century in China. Uh, you could say that the Falun Gong or the Yi Guan Tao are the sort of iceberg uh, protrusions of that phenomenon. Uh, in China. Even as Tianxia becomes the state ideology, Tian, however, heaven itself, not all under heaven, but heaven itself, remains a civic cultural uh, authority and represents the politics of non-politics, right? The politics of the non-political, which was Vaclav Havel's way of putting that very interesting phenomenon, or what I sometimes call the Tian sphere, as opposed to the to the civil society sphere, right? Uh, here are some modern paintings of Chu Yan, uh, 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 his questions to heaven. Uh, this is Tian Tan, this is the Temple of Heaven in Beijing, which I'm sure all of you have seen when you go for your tourist visits. Uh, it is where, it was a privatized place for imperial worship, but it was sounded out in the rest of the empire and which then organized uh, and synchronized its activity around this, this unseen activity. So it really, heaven pervades through these ritual moments and uh, this uh, spatio-temporal synchronization. Sustainability and transcendence, how do we now get to this important issue? Is it uh, possible to feasibly elevate sustainability to a transcendent ideal? It seems to me, and I've always had debates when I presented this, that the main obstacle is the imperative of national leaders to not sacrifice national interests. Of course, behind this is also the untrammeled power of capitalist consumption, right? So if we said nationalism and consumption were the main issues, uh, capitalist consumption will sort, sort of push this and get ready consumers. But, uh, but I think it's clear that historically, uh, it has been political structures that have regulated uh, uh, capital. So capital in and of itself will not do it. It is only if you legislate green technology and if you legislate and regulate and have a decent means of regulating how it behaves, it will do so. For instance, there has been a proposal repeatedly made by Mutsuyoshi Nishimura, who was the former chief and behind the Kyoto Protocol, for instance, uh, climate negotiator of Japan, he says he has an interesting idea that somehow is never taken seriously, that governments, all governments in the world should collectively own the uh, carbon budget, which should be capped in order to achieve uh, climate, uh, to uh, uh, achieve uh, regulation of the climate, uh, you uh, cap it at 600 billion GT, uh, GT in total emissions for 40 years. Then these carbon credits could be auctioned off either by governments to their own people or uh, outside. And uh, within that, then some people said, but you, that's a total free market system and you, you know. He says, okay, we can build it in hand, handicap for nations that are not yet developed and so on. But the interesting thing is that everybody likes the uh, program, but from all sides, their objections are principally national, right? Uh, China will not do it unless the US does it. US will not do it unless China does it. And, um, and this plan always faces this, what they call euphemistically, national mitigation obligations, right? And there are a few other euphemistic terms. So, so it seems to me that the major path uh, 
emerging in the world is really transnational civil society. Uh, NGOs, quasi-government agencies, private public initiatives. This may well be the thin sphere, uh, but it is the alternative and authoritative realm for self and value formation. And in this sense, it's closer to what Gramsci called preparing for the war of protected, war of position, right? Where you create a counter-hegemonic uh, ideology, right, uh, to, to go on doing this. And we have actually globally many sources for this. It's just completely, it's uncoordinated or it's difficult to coordinate. We don't yet have the means. You have from organization from Earth First to IPCC, ecotourism, um, intellectual move, intellectually of movements like from Small is Beautiful, Deep Ecology, which is a very interesting movement, Buddhist economics, animal economics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What you need is a goal of universal sustainability where nations have to share sovereignty on many issues related to, I can't read the rest, uh, related to the environment and uh, Okay, here is uh, some instances. Uh, one of the most important places for environmental NGOs, certainly in the developing world, uh, is Yunnan, Yunnan province in China. And they have uh, thousands of environmental NGOs. China, in fact, has the best environmental policies of any developing nation. And it also has a very active program of environmental public education, certainly the best in the developing world. And as I said, the NGO sector is also very developed. Um, and actually, there's a very interesting story, again, relating to the Three Gorges. There was, you know, the Three Gorges Dam uh, on the Yangtze, on the uh, Changyang, was uh, developed over two phases, one before 19, uh, 2000 and one after 2000, the year 2000. In the first phase, all the money came from, or most of the money came from international sources, whether it's the IMF, World Bank, uh, national governments, European national governments, uh, as well as Morgan Stanley, this, that, and the other. There was a lot of very covert organizing by Chinese NGOs against that, talking about the environmental damages and so on. By 2000, <coughs> the international NGO scene had picked up on this uh, Chinese uh, knowledge that was by scientists, important scientists in China. And uh, they had started lobbying with the international financiers so that it was not just Western nations and the IMF and others that uh, refused the second tranche of spending, but even organizations like private financial firms like uh, investment banks like Morgan Stanley and so on, were pressured by their shareholders to not invest. So the cost became much higher for the Chinese government as a result. And so this was, but this is a very interesting way of seeing of how the scaling system works in the globalized world today. So um, at the same time, however, while there is all this uh, environmental education in China, it still is one of those study subjects that we studied in schools, like civics or something, which nobody took seriously. It was not a part of the big examination system. It's just something you had to do. And besides, these kids are always, you know, they don't have anything to do. How do they know the environment? They're sitting and watching TV, and now they're doing all those other things, right, that you do with your little personal phone. What are they called? Uh, what phones? Anyway, uh, and so on. But uh, their fingers are getting longer. <laughs> and uh, uh, so what happened, there were some very interesting Yunnan uh, NGOs, environmental NGOs. What they started doing was saying, let's get these kids out and take them into the environment and tell them and show them how their environment actually affects them, right? talking about native plants, clearing the environment, this, that. And it has had, it's limited, but it's had some success. So what they've done, and in a very interesting way, they've used an old Republican and uh, European idea of Heimat or Xiangtu, or uh, you know, hometown uh, consciousness, to sort of rebuild this kind of thing, to build, to get the environment curriculum very much with practicums and so on. 
and uh, and yeah, that's so this I think suggests to us that they realize that self formation and local identity must be built with environmental and universal sustainability as goals, right? So this is that methodology I was trying to talk about. Requires us once again to learn from historical universalisms, how to revere nature, not just how to revere nature, but this whole methodology of the self and how it links. So the, the self to local, environmental to universal. Self to local environment to universal. Tian and Chinese practices of self-cultivation are actually very useful because they were, from the start, uh, linked to Tian Ren Hui, where humans and heaven are part of one order. And we do have in China, also in North China, the new rural, rural reconstruction movements led by all these uh, famous people, Wen Tejun, Cao Jingqing, Li Changpeng, who develop cooperative, protective, and integrated reconstruction. They link their movements both to older movements, but they're also very closely linked to wider global uh, movements of sustainability. Uh, I have an interesting story for you here. This is more like an anecdote. The Chinese Taoist Association, uh, which incidentally is uh, an official organization, and you know people usually laugh at these official religions. They are, don't have any power and so on. But the Chinese Taoist Association is even less powerful than the Buddhist or the Confucian Association. They weren't getting anywhere until in 1995 they found a way to refashion themselves. They linked up with an organization called the Global NGO Alliance of Religion and Conservation, which is headed by none other than Prince Philip in Bath in uh, UK, <laughs> and uh, to collaborate for the greening of Taoism. So what has happened here is that Lao Tzu has morphed into the god of ecological <laughs> protection, Sheng Tai Pao Hu Shen. And when you go there, you know, for instance, and, but they do control a lot. They control because internal tourism, because Taoist temples are in these mountains and they're very popular sites for tourism and so on. When you go there, uh, and they control all the temples. That's the one thing that they do. Uh, you cannot burn more than three sticks of incense. You have to, uh, you know, walk a certain path that doesn't destroy the environment. Sorry, two more minutes. And uh, the, uh, they have to do all of these, uh, you know, be environmentally friendly, etc. So what we're seeing here is a symbolic mobilization of the process where individuals can convert his or her personal experience into the truth. This is what Foucault calls the games of truth, right? We mobilize self-cultivation practices uh, that were there in Chinese historical philosophies. I also have a segment in the paper which talks about Tagore Shantiniketan, which tried to do very similar kinds of methodologies. And Gandhi, I think, is also very interesting in this. So we need to rethink the relations between the sacred symbols and rational discussion. I haven't had a chance to get into it. It's there in the paper. Rationality must be built on figures of hope for planetary sustainability. Of course, figures of hope, when Paul Ricoeur talks about it, refers to Jesus. But I'm referring to the movie Avatar. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I'll show you in a minute. But government machines, so the task ahead of us, I think, is very clear. Government machineries and social groups need to devote as much time and importance to planetary sustainability in education as they do on national history and national identity building. This, I think, is the challenge for the transcendent profits of our time. Let me show you some pictures. Here is this Alliance of Religion and Conservation website. I love the Taoist flag. So it's so green, right? And uh, this is Master Ren of Lo Kuan Thai reading the Mao Shan Declaration. And you know, this is their refashioning, being relevant. I think it's a wonderful thing that they've done. And this is Cambodia's avatars, painted with uh, painted faces. These are uh, the Cambodian activists uh, to save the Prelang forests, and they demand the government stop granting economic and suspend all those grants. The protesters who call themselves Cambodia's avatars had their bodies painted in green and blue and wore traditional ethnic Kui clothes, including hats made from tree materials. What was very interesting, yesterday I heard a paper by uh, a young lady uh, who, uh, uh, Ms. Guo, I think, right, is she here? Uh, which talked about how the film Confucius 
was released at the same time as the uh, movie Avatars, and how, in fact, the uh, uh, after a while, uh, you know, and Avatars was much more popular uh, because a Confucian was also sh shown as a statist <laughs> in that movie and a warrior and a nationalist, and uh, whereas the Avatar thing had much more appeal and and grossed much more because also at that time a woman had been evicted from and that case uh, was made very public at that time so you never know how things work here and how that counter uh, hegemony might work okay i'll leave it at that thank you <laughs>